The coronavirus pandemic has exposed the fragilities in our economies and societies and highlighted how efficiency is often prioritized above resilience. Meanwhile, the worsening environmental crisis has led to a range of voices warning that fragilities will be tested to the limit by worsening natural shocks. This episode explores these fragilities in more detail and the possible impacts of the environmental crisis and other problems into the future. And to do so, I'm joined by Dr. Nafiz Ahmed, Executive Director of the System Shift Lab, Research Fellow at the Schumacher Institute, and Nafiz writes regularly about systems change at Vice's science magazine, Motherboard. He's also the author of a number of books, including Failing States, Collapsing Systems, Biophysical Triggers of Political Violence, which is published by Springer. Nafiz, welcome. Hi. Um, let's start with the question about the coronavirus pandemic. Can you uh, give us some ideas about how the pandemic and the shock that it's brought to our societies has helped us understand the fragilities that we have across our social and economic systems, particularly at a global level? So good question. I mean, I think the first kind of quite obvious thing is the way in which a tiny microscopic entity has managed to bring the vast captains of industry in a way to its knees um, in a way that probably has gone far beyond even what some of the kind of kind of preparedness and planning that has gone on in relation to pandemics it's kind of really taken us by surprise if you look at the planning literature um, you know, there's been dis there's been some there's been some anticipation of huge disruption and things like that. But I think that the scale of it, the long lasting nature of it, and the complexity of the impacts on so many different areas of our society has has taken us all aback to some extent. We we found ourselves quite deeply unprepared, yeah. despite lots of preparation. And it's kind of ironic that actually the United States and the UK, which were previously considered to be the best uh, planners. Uh, for a kind of a, a pandemic have actually had the worst death rates. Um, and I think this is because of the reality that what one of the things that's been exposed is the tightly coupled nature of our social, political and economic systems. And we're, it's really highlighted the extent to which you cannot really escape. You know, th there, are, there is a, this vast interconnection between these different systems and these shocks that happen in one place and in one sector are rapidly transmitted uh, across other societies and other sectors in ways that are very, very difficult to predict. And I think it, again, we've been reminded of some of the things that we, we know about chaos and complexity, but we're reminded of how fast and how rapidly and unpredictably those things can unfold. And no one can really predict the results of an event like this. I think that's the one of the biggest learning points is that when something like this happens, it's inherently impossible to really de detect where it's gonna go because of that complexity. Different things can happen in different ways. Um, but I think what's quite particularly alarming and I think perhaps not so much on people's radar is the way in, in which this has impacted some of the critical sectors that we consider to be important for um, delivering public goods and services and kind of keeping the show on the road. Mm -hmm. so the energy sector, you know, the oil industry sector has been hit in a massive way. If you look at pandemic preparedness planning, oil sector was not something that would ever emerge in discussions about impacts. You know, it was public health, um, workers, workforce issues, things like that. But the energy industry, no, not something that anyone thought about. It's been massively impacted um, and it's exposed, again, kind of unsustainabilities, la uh, lack of economic uh, kind of sustainability in the profitability margins and uh, unsustainabilities in the way in which oil industries are structured. All sorts of kind of problems in that industry have been exposed. And there's this big question as to whether that industry can actually survive in coming years and decades in a lower demand environment. That too has raised all sorts of questions about economic growth structures, profitability of businesses and industries overall, whether they can survive in that kind of environment. Um, 
And of course, there's all sorts of ramifying consequences in terms of the impact on our food systems and our manufacturing systems, which again, generally based on far flung supply chains, uh, interconnected global uh, kind of distribution networks. And what we're again seeing is that all of these things are now big question marks over how we can sustain these in, in an environment with, um, you know, oil may not be so uh, available in the, in the near future. We have this kind of strange situation where there is a huge amount of cheap oil that there's no demand for, and it's so cheaply available and the profit margins have now, the profits for the industry have plummeted to such a degree that the very survival of these industries and their ability to continue producing is now at stake. So there is this strange kind of nexus where we're at the, there's an oil glut, which could be a precursor for a future of, of scarcity. And where that goes and how that impacts prices and the dynamics in our economies, nobody actually knows. We have no idea. We're still kind of trying to figure this out. So if we conceive of the coronavirus pandemic as, as a shock that has then rippled out often in unexpected ways across our interconnected systems, let's talk a bit about how um, growing environmental shocks can do the same. Now, I know this is something that you've often written about. Um, as we look towards a future in which we're going to see the increasing negative consequences of higher global temperatures, of other damage to um, parts of the environment, what kind of um, system-wide knock-on effects do we anticipate coming from growing environmental destabilization? Well, I think it's useful to situate the COVID-19 pandemic in the context of a wider process of systemic decline, which has actually been accelerating. It's not something that is beginning now. It's something that's probably started um, several decades ago, and there's lots of indicators of that. There are measures such as net energy, EROI, energy return on investment from our energy system, which we know, looking at all the global studies that have been done, that the energy return on investment from global fossil fuels has begun to decline over several decades. Um, and that's had correlated with lots of other things, such as uh, a decline in the rate of GDP growth, which economists describe that as secular stagnation. But it, these are these are longer term trends which preceded things like you know big eruptions like the two thousand eight financial crash um, and things like that. So I think what's useful to do is to kind of take a step back and say a lot of these processes kind of began around the nineteen sixties nineteen seventies, which coincides with a period when, say, an NGO like the Global Footprint Network would have said we kind of really hit that point of overshoot. And overshoot is a concept which tries to get at the fact that we've got to a point where the rate at which we're consuming natural resources is overshooting their ability to renew and the rate that they take, the time they take to renew. You know, and I think some of the, you know, the stats are something like we're consuming the equivalent of like one and a half planets, something like that. Um, and it's only getting worse. And what's interesting is a lot of these inflection points where we started seeing these exponential growth rates in certain things, all kicked off around the 1970s. So we see the EROI really starts to go down at that point. We see um, the rate of economic growth for the industrialized nations beginning to decline and accelerating. But there's, there's also um, a correlation with political destabilization and civil unrest. Um, so again, these correlations are complicated. We don't know how they work causally, you know, I mean, I don't want to make a simplistic reductive argument, but the reality is they have been happening around the same time. So if we take that big picture lens, what that suggests is, you know, looking at the kind of planetary boundaries framework that's been developed by a number of climate scientists who say, look, you know, there are something like nine of these really key planetary boundaries around, you know, nitrogen and um, land use change and you know these key kind of ecosystems where if you cross that that kind of metric too far you're at risk of destabilizing it to a point where not only are there irreversible changes but what they call the you know the safe operating space for human civilization begins to erode it decreases and i can i can i think what we're starting to see is that that process is happening further and further in the 2008 financial crash 
was one episode that we saw we also, that was correlated with many other things. You know, there was a sequence of climate events, um, you know, big food basket failures, which led up to the Arab Spring uh, in 2011. Obviously, we had the Occupy move, uh, up, uh, uprising shortly before then. Um, and we've had a kind of a re reoccurrence of the Arab Spring type uprisings in, the, in recent years as well, where people thought that, okay, we've, we've finished with that episode now. But 10 years later, you know, people are have coming out on the streets again and there's been further destabilization. And that's been linked with all sorts of things going on in Syria and elsewhere. But again, the complicated nature of that, when we look at some of the studies which show that, well, there was a drought cycle component to the Syria crisis which obviously had an impact on Brexit and the Trump elections because of the mass migration of people from the Middle East onto the shores of Europe and, to, and, to the, and the way that that impacted politics here kind of, kind of gave rise to these xenophobic movements. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is this sense that within this very complex global system that we're in, we're seeing these kind of amplifying feedback processes that we really don't have a handle on we barely really understand those complexities and we're only beginning to understand and that's how our socio-economic and political systems are, are being destabilized because we're, we're not really able to see those connecting points I and mean, who would connect you know the trump elections the brexit elections with something going on far flung in the middle east and a drought cycle in syria for example it's not a connecting factor that we'd always think about but i think those those correlations are there what that suggests to me is that the COVID-19 pandemic is really kind of a really kind of an early warning signal of, of, of how, how, how kind of wide ranging and unpredictable these kinds of episodes are. And, you know, if you go back five years earlier when I think the, the, the Planetary Boundaries folk pu published one of their seminal analyses in, in the Science Journal, and they said that you know, land use change was one of the boundaries that where we're, we're seeing extreme risk. And five years on, we've now had a pandemic, and there are multiple reports from the UN and elsewhere pointing out that deforestation, excessive land use change, obviously driven by our cons this giant consumption machine that we have, um, has you know exacerbated this risk of zoonotic diseases. And we've had these warnings of pandemics, you know, for the last few decades. And now we're here, you know, that's, it's, it's not what was previously potentially science fiction has now become our reality. So in the next couple of decades, what we're going to see is that this confluence of amplifying feedbacks and dynamics that we're seeing now will likely accelerate on a business as usual trajectory, but in ways that we can't predict. We, they will be very inherently difficult to predict. And I think this is the thing. Everyone, uh, you know, a lot of the scientists who are looking at pandemics knew that a pandemic would hit at some point, somehow, they didn't know what kind, they weren't sure where, um, and they weren't sure when. And that's the kind of unknown that we're walking into, that we know that there could be a further economic uh, disaster. We know that there could be a collapse of food systems. We know that there could be um, a, a failure of our energy systems at some point. These are all kind of major crises that have been warned about. We also know that there is a heightened risk of pandemics if we continue. So I think the, uh, there's a risk of all of these different kind of discrete things going on. And of course, there's also the geopolitical context, the unpredictable impacts on our societies, like it's the, you know, the Black Lives Matter uprising emerging in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. And, and the reality that clearly that pan the pandemic has brought out this, um, the, 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 the grievances and disillusionment and uh, long-standing inequalities that have existed for many, many years. That is probably going to continue. Now, I would imagine that we will see a future of continued political unrest as and when some of these economic impacts, the impacts of more business failures, retail sector failures, industries failing, more and more unemployment, people not able to see a way out. That kind of scenario is something in the near term is you know, very likely that we'll see further destabilization without the right sort of approach to kind of mitigate and address those consequences. So I see a lot of this playing out in an accelerated fashion on a business as usual trajectory. Um, and I think it's important to bear in mind that that kind of trajectory is one that, as I said before,
is 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 a wild card future it's not one that you can really predict or um really you can't plan for that you can't plan for this process and to frame that it's important to frame that against a wider uh, systems view which re which recognizes that this is really the unfolding of a of a deeper process of a system in decline it's 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 an existing system which is essentially run out of steam um and it can't really survive anymore and it's kind of reaching that kind of that point of of of, of fundamental transition and one of the concepts i always use is this idea of a phase shift that we're really in a in a, in a transition point to what could be the emergence of a new system and I think that's where I think it's important to center our attention is that while, while there is a lot of failure that's going to come within this system, there is this massive opportunity for something new to emerge. And, and when we look at the life cycle of previous systems and different civilizations, but also learning from the life cycle of different ecosystems in history, and I'm thinking about the work of C.S. Holling and his um, adaptive cycle theory, which he drew from the study of, of different ecosystems. You know, we have a lot of good reason to suspect that there is a, you know, while we're on the, you know, we're, we're moving down this kind of, this trajectory of decline, as that happens, there is a breaking up of the old power structures and old, old, you know, kind of ways of thinking, which opens up new opportunities in a way that perhaps 10, 20, 30 years ago would, would have literally been impossible. And the kind of radical thinking and radical policies that were once uh, that we that we need actually to to get through this to the other side are now going to be a lot more palatable and a lot more easier to get out there but you know we need to mm -hmm. roll up our sleeves and i think that's a great note to finish on nafis thank you so much for joining us thanks laurie